Hello, my name is James Mafione and I work for a company called Decision Strategies. If you're watching this video, chances are you've, you've heard of us before, but today I want to talk about a very particular topic and that's improved project execution through cost and schedule analysis. In the latter half of the video, I'll give a tutorial on how to use the tool we have for download on our website for free, uh, www.decisionstrategies.com. If you're just interested in those instructions for the tool, you can skip ahead now to... and that's where the tutorial will begin. So why is good project execution so important? Intuitively, the longer it takes to complete the project, the more it will cost. Also, the longer it takes to complete that project, the bigger the disconnect between when you spend the money and eventually start earning the revenues. And higher cost and delayed revenues both lead to significantly lower project value. They also lead to unhappy investors. If you have much experience working on mega projects, then you probably know all too well how delayed and how costly they can become. In this video, I'm going to put forward two arguments. The first is, the very nature of project work makes this delay almost inevitable. And the second is, our end goal is not to estimate a range of possible outcomes, but rather to achieve the results we desire, despite the challenges. To illustrate the first point, I'm going to give a couple of examples. Let's take this basic Gantt chart view, where each task is estimated at a set duration and set cost. The expert who put the schedule together has the experience to know that things could potentially take longer and cost more. But in the traditional view, a fixed estimate is required, so we generally give a fairly optimistic assessment. We picture most things going fairly smoothly, and then maybe we'll pad that number a bit to account for some things going wrong. Experience tells us that things can and do go very poorly, but there's no way to convey those risks when putting together a traditional schedule. So for example, we're going to say that our expert gave us P50 estimates. In their mind, there's a 50% chance each activity could go longer than it is as listed, and a 50% chance it could finish up sooner than the estimate given. And if we look, we can see we've got activities 1, 2, and 3 all must complete before activity 4 can begin. Activity 2 is, is a little bit longer than activities 1 and 3, so in schedule speak, we call that a critical path item. It's activity 2 that's really holding up activity 4 from beginning. But they're pretty close, so we'll say that Activity 1 and Activity 3 each have a 45% chance of going longer than Activity 2 as listed. So here's a big kicker. If we say that there's a 55% chance that Activity 1 will end before Activity 4 is set to begin, and a 50% chance that Activity 2 will end on time, and another 55% chance that Activity 3 will complete before Activity 4 as, as listed here, then there's in fact only a 15% probability that we're going to start activity 4 on time. For 1 and 2 and 3 all to complete before activity 4 begins, that's a 55% chance times a 50% chance times a 55% chance, is only a 15% chance that our little basic schedule, activity 4, is going to begin as started. Now in major projects, there's not three tasks in parallel. You've got tens of thousands of activities in your, in your project plan. So, not convinced that the deck is stacked, so to speak, against the project team? I'm going to give one more example from our training course. This time we're going to take a schedule containing 20 tasks, each one right after the other. We're going to say that they're 16 weeks in duration, so that the total duration of all 20 tasks comes to 320 weeks. But let's stop and take a moment and think about how long each of these tasks could really take to complete. Now, when we give a schedule estimate, we know that things could finish sooner than expected. But there's a limit to how much faster we can work. On the flip side, when things get delayed, they can get really delayed. So if you take a given activity and you plot all the possible outcomes and their likelihood of occurring, you get something like this. With a long tail off to the right contain those very unlikely but very unfavorable outcomes. And the effect of having that possibility of going far over schedule serves to shift the average of a curve like this out longer than the P50 estimate. And that's very technical. I won't get into it here. We, we talk about it in our, our training course. But what I want to talk about is why that matters. So if we build a model that allows us to calculate the schedule over and over again, each time trying a different value from across that range for each of our 20 tasks, and we plot the overall results, we get something that looks like this. So if we look across the bottom and find our original estimate of 320 weeks here, we follow it up to the curve and look across, we can see there's a 14% probability of completing in 320 weeks or less. 
and only 14% probability of making our scheduled completion date. So what's going on here? When you sum independent items probabilistically, the answer tends to converge around the sum of the means, not the sum of the P50s. And what that means for us is an extremely low likelihood, 14%, of making our advertised completion date. So I keep going, and in our training course we talk about correlation and discrete risks, but what I really want to stress is my second point. That regardless of the challenge, our job is to execute the project such that we get the cost and schedule results that we desire. To do this, we, we do need to understand the range of possible results. But what we're really interested in uncovering is why the project could be late or over budget. As consultants, we at Decision Strategies are uniquely positioned to act as unbiased facilitators. We're capable of leading multidiscipline teams through this discovery process. We help them to roll the schedule up to the right level of activities and then discuss each in terms of what could lead to a favorable or unfavorable outcome. It's only once we've documented these drivers that do we begin to speak in numerical estimates, and we do so in terms of ranged inputs. These inputs form the basis of our probabilistic model that when we run, we get the overall range result for the project. And here's where many stop, with an S-curve result for end date and total cost. But we're not done. What we truly desire is to achieve a favorable result. And to do this, we need to understand what's driving our potential for a poor outcome. It's our documented drivers from the team discussions coupled with the impact shown in our modeling. We can then reconvene as a team and begin to plan and prepare for these risks. How will we execute our project differently? What indicators will tell us that our risks are starting to materialize? And what mitigation plans will we enact if we start to see those indicators? It's this planning and preparation that we're after. How will we execute the project differently so that we can achieve the results we desire? So let's talk now about how to use the free tool available for download at www.decisionstrategies.com. There are lots of very complicated software applications out there on the market that are quite good. I'd recommend them for any project that warranted dedicated cost and schedule personnel. This tool, on the other hand, is not only free, but it's intended for more of a project manager who wishes to get a high-level understanding of the implications of project risk without having to learn a complicated application. So we'll switch views now, we'll go to my desktop, and I'll show you how to use the free tool. We'll start by opening a new file, and we'll need to make sure that macros are enabled. We'll get a few messages, and then we'll give our file a name and save it as a macro-enabled workbook, uh, .xlsm. We then go to the Schedule Input Worksheet along the bottom and the Decision Strategies ribbon along the top. Here we'll find all the tool controls. Before we start entering our schedule items, let's take a moment to configure some of our settings. If we click the Configure Correlation button here in the ribbon, we'll bring up an entry screen. As you'll see in a minute, we'll have the ability to tag each of our estimates to a correlation group. That is, any item assigned to the group will be correlated to the other items in the group. When one is at the high end of its range, the others will tend to be as well, and when one is low, the others will be lower too. In this screen, we can give the groupings descriptive names and set the factor by which the items in the group are correlated. I've already named a few of the groups and assigned the factors. So I'll just hit Submit. We can then begin building out our schedule by clicking the Add Activity button, also found in the ribbon. A screen appears where we can enter our activity data, and for this first entry, I will create one called Acquire Land. Of course, you would enter whatever your first activity is for your project, and I recommend you combine as many smaller tasks together as you can to come up with a fairly high-level activity breakdown. I'll give this activity a start date, but you'll notice I won't do this for the following activities as I want them to begin as soon as the activities before them complete. There's an affected by weather option here, and setting it to no will tell the model not to delay this project based on any weather events that happen in the simulation. 
On another screen, we can configure the weather settings in the model, and we'll cover that later. Now, before I get to the numerical forecast, I want to come to these text fields and describe the conditions that drive the favorable and unfavorable outcome. In our consulting, we call this a pre-mortem. I tell you that the result was particularly bad, and then you tell me what must have happened. This helps us to expand our thinking and remove bias when we do get to talking numbers. For our example, I'll just paste in some comments, and we can say that they came from our expert interview with the company Landman. Down here, I'm going to enter my estimate for this task's duration. I'm going to enter my ranges in terms of months, like so. And I'll enter 3 as the P10 estimate. That is, I believe there's only a 10% probability that it will take less than 3 months to complete this task. Likewise, a 50% probability that it will take less than 4.5 months. And a 90% probability it will take less than 8 months to complete. If I didn't want to enter a range and instead use a single fixed number, I could either enter the same value for the P10, P50, and P90, or just enter P50 and leave the P10 and P90 blank. And that's blank, mind you, not, not a zero. Here to the right, you'll see an option for assigning a correlation group. If I were to choose an option in the drop-down, then this activity would be correlated to all other activities in the schedule that are also linked to the group, per our settings when we clicked on the Configure Correlation button earlier. I'm going to skip spread costs for this activity. Those are costs that are incurred per unit time, like dollars per month, million dollars per day, and so on. I am going to give this activity a one-time cost of between 30 and 50 million dollars. It is an uncertainty assessment as to what this activity could cost. In this case, the cost to acquire the land. But it does not go up based on the duration of the task, like a spread cost would. Now we'll hit Submit, and we'll see our first activity displayed on the Schedule Input Worksheet. If I want to go back and edit any information, I can just click on the activity shape, and the entry screen will reappear. Now we can continue to populate our schedule. I'll again click the Add Activity button and start by giving the activity a name. You can see that the Direct Precedence field now displays a list of all the other activities we've created. In this case, just the one so far. I'm going to click on Acquire Land and that will tell the tool that the acquire land activity must complete before this activity can begin. It's key to note that I'm going to leave the earliest start field blank on purpose here. That way this activity will begin as soon as all of its direct precedents end. If I put a date, then the tool will not allow the activity to start before the date entered, even if all the direct precedents have completed. It will wait until both the date is reached and all preceding activities have finished. For the sake of time, I'm going to leave most of the rest of these fields blank. I'll just give the activity a duration of one to three months with a P50 of a month and a half. I'll then hit submit and we'll see the activity on our entry screen with a connecting line showing the relationship to our first activity. I'll fast forward and skip ahead now to a completed schedule. Okay, here's the complete schedule that I've already put together. Notice this red line connecting some of the activities. That is our critical path, the set of activities that, due to their end dates and relationships, limit how soon the overall project can complete. Now because we entered range estimates, this path can actually change, putting what are called near critical path elements onto the critical path in some iterations. I'll get ahead of myself a little and click this single step button in the ribbon, and we can watch the critical path change. This is a key concept as project teams often focus a lot of attention on the critical path items only to be surprised when the near critical path elements begin to delay the project. Now we're almost ready to run the simulation. Just one more configuration to go and that is the weather. 
I return to the ribbon and click the Configure Weather button. A screen appears where we can enter the probability a major weather event will occur during each month and the number of days impact to ongoing work if the event does in fact occur. For a basic example, let's say that our project work is located in an area that gets heavy winter storms. We've gone through the historic data and gauged that there's a 15% probability of such a storm each December. And if a storm strikes, any work being done outside will have to shut down for four to eight days. The tool is smart enough to apply these risks uniquely to each December within the project timeline and will know which activities are both actively underway in each month and tagged as being subject to weather delays. I've already entered the weather data for this example, so I'll click Submit. Now we can run our simulation. We click the Run Simulation button in the ribbon and a screen will appear where we can tell the tool how many trials to run. In each trial, a different value will be used for each range variable and the tool will record the overall project length and total cost that results. When all the trials have been run, the tool will sort the results and give us the statistically valid range of potential outcomes for our project. Let's run 25,000 to get a good full data set and click OK. I'll fast forward the video to the end to save time. Alright, and we're back. The tool should automatically skip to the results worksheet, but if not, you can go there manually by clicking the tab at the bottom here. The first chart we see shows potential project costs along the bottom axis and cumulative probability along the y-axis. You read the chart by choosing a value along the bottom, let's say 80 million, following a straight line up to the curve, and then looking over to the left where we find ourselves crossing the vertical axis at about 55%. That is, we have a 55% probability of completing the project for 80 million or less. To make reading a bit easier, we can use these yellow cells here and ask the tool what the probability is that the cost will be between 0 and 80 million. You see the green text tells us exactly 55%, and we can check this box labeled display to see it highlighted on our chart. Now if we scroll down, we can see a similar style display this time for project completion date. Here's, here it appears as though we have an average end date of May 31st, 2017. Now if we look to the top right display, back up here, we can get a little more insight into the near critical path elements I spoke of earlier. What we see is our top 15 activities based upon their likelihood to drive the critical path. Some are on the critical path 100% of the time and are surely monitored closely by the team. But there are a number that appear on the critical path in about half of the trials and probably warrant extra attention by the team to stay on top of the work to prevent them from driving the schedule. The last bit of information we see is a summary of the average start date, time to complete, and total cost for each activity, as well as a summary of their input values. Combining all this information, we can see how long and costly the overall project can be and can identify the key tasks that are driving the outcome. We can then return to our notes where we talk through the unfavorable scenarios for each task and begin to think in terms of mitigating actions and changes to our execution approach. What leads to these unfavorable outcomes? What signs will tell us that we are headed into our envisioned bad scenario and how will we respond if we see these early warning signs? We can test our new plans by modifying our entries and rerunning the model, and then ultimately, it is up to us to apply the insight and execute the project to schedule and budget. Okay, so that concludes the tutorial. Uh, thank you for watching the video. Thank you for downloading the tool. If you're using it and you have questions or get stuck, please don't hesitate to contact us. We put our tools out there for free download so that people use them. Um, and so if you need help getting started, just go to our website, www.decisionstrategies.com, and all of our contact information will be there. Uh, thank you.